Uh, again, Harry Burkholder, Executive Director of the Land Information Access Association, otherwise known as LIAA. We're a nonprofit group uh, out of Traverse City. Uh, for the last eight or so years, we've been working in kind of the world of resilience, um, more specifically at the planning level. So today I want to talk about a little bit what we've done for the last couple of years, some of the lessons that we've learned, some of the tools and techniques that we've done that dovetail what you heard today, and then I hope to maybe have a small conversation at the end on an issue that I don't think it's talked quite enough about, um, but we see it starting to really kind of uh, move forward in a lot of the work that we've done related to this picture. So remember this picture because we're going to come back to it. Um, we got a, a grant uh, originally from the Kresge Foundation eight years ago to look at ways that we could talk about climate change and resilience within the master planning process. So we had done a lot of research in Michigan about who's doing that work, climate adaptation, resilience work, talking about climate change. And we found they were very specific plans. They were climate action plans or climate adaptation plans. Um, but as planners, we felt, wouldn't it be great, because when you talk about all of these things, you're really talking about systems, that wouldn't that be great if you bake that into a master planning process? So I, do we have any planning officials in the room? I was gonna ask that first. Anyone on planning commissions? No planning commissioners? All right. Hey, we got one, good. That's one, all right. So the master plan, ideally, if it's done right, is kind of that guiding document for community in terms of land use, but it can also address some of the other systems, whether it's transportation, stormwater management, recreation that in your community. So uh, we kind of proposed this to the Kresge Foundation and they funded our work to really do the climate resiliency discussion into a larger master planning process. Our first project uh, was in the city of Monroe and then the two surrounding jurisdictions, uh, two townships. Uh, we invited the Coastal Zone Management Program to participate, given the coastal resources of Monroe. Um, and they were really excited about the work and they said, we gotta get a larger team together. So that's exactly what they did. So the next year, we started working with the University of Michigan and then Michigan Tech. Those are our primary partners for this project, uh, along with funding from Office of the Great Lakes, NOAA, and CZM, which is now, uh, you probably know, is in DNR. Um, so now we've worked in all the communities that you see on the bottom of the screen, working at ways to bring resilience in this larger discussion uh, within the, la the larger master planning process. Um, we are also working with the Michigan Municipal League and Michigan Townships Association uh, as partners on this, and then most recently with the Michigan Association of Planning. I know we have like one planner here, but the last week the big uh, MAP Spring Institute was uh, in Lansing, and the whole day was devoted to this topic. Um, so a lot of what you're going to see are what's kind of on um, sort of planning trends around the, uh, in front of planning commissions as we're talking about this. So what is community resilience? And really that can, uh, you know, the definition of what that is really dictates by who's in the room. So if you're talking to uh, emergency managers, you're talking about um, resilience in terms of kind of a severe storm or, or something uh, like that. If you're talking to a room like the Chamber of Commerce and you're really talking about economic resilience. So really kind of, you know, when you think about that word, we kind of think in the larger context about what the audience is, but when we talk about community resilience, um, there's a lot of definitions, but one that we really like is from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, which is a group of practitioners and local officials from, from more than throughout the Midwest. They get together and talk about these issues and then kind of work on them. So I'll read this, but this is the only one that I'll read word for word, the ability of a community to anticipate, accommodate, and positively adapt to or thrive amidst changing climate conditions or hazard events and enhance quality of life, reliable systems, economic vitality, vitality, and conservation of resources for present and future generations. So by looking at that, we're obviously talking about the climate piece, but we're really talking about the entire systems within a community and what that means. We've all heard about resilience is really responding to the shocks of the system. And when we're talking about this kind of lens of climate change, we're really talking about you know, unanticipated storms, severe flooding, or even fire in some um, respects. But when we're talking about the larger community, we're also uh, thinking about the other end of the spectrum. What is our economic resilience to, let's say the plant closes, or you know, we lose 150 jobs. Those all interplay off of each other in the community and have consequences for how dollars are allocated and how resources are allocated as well. So we have that shocks piece, but there's also stresses. Stresses are those factors that pressure a community on a daily or reoccurring basis. 
maybe that is something like uh, higher unemployment within your community that impacts the rest of uh, those decision processes. So a focus on both the shocks and the stresses is important to really come up to develop that adaptive capacity um, and really looking again at vulnerable areas. So we talked a little bit about vulnerability in terms of that for resources this morning. I want to shift gears a little bit to vulnerability in terms of the people of the community. Because in every community that we've worked in, no matter how much data you have, it really comes down to people making decisions in a room and how those interplay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And it's also that capacity to, to learn from how your community is adapted. And you take what you've learned in the past, anticipate what's coming in the future, and adapt to that quickly. That's really what the, the larger idea of resilience from. I get asked this a lot of times, where did the term resilience come from? Well, it's really been around for over 200 years, typically in the context of ecology or the environment. So if you think about kind of pre-1930s, of the Midwestern prairie of the United States that was completely covered with uh, prairie grass, able to withstand some of the severe droughts that go through there because their root systems are four feet deep. And what did we do? We said we gotta actually farm this area. So we cleared all those natural grasses not being resilient anymore, and essentially planted mostly wheat, which has a much shorter root system. And when we did that, it kind of loosened the soil, and then we happen to have some of the worst drought conditions in U.S. history, which led to then into the devastation of the Dust Bowl. So our, the resilience idea is really built into kind of the ecology and DNA of our, of our environment. And when we mess with that, we can get unintended con consequences. We also hear uh, a lot uh, from, especially the planning community, haven't we heard this idea before? And the answer is yes, you have, uh, often. Um, it really com comes out of a lot of the planning movements of the last 30 to 40 years. Most of you have probably heard of sustainable development, uh, which again is looking at ways uh, to uh, have renewable resources, an idea of uh, equity within the community, um, and then living kind of that balance between the natural environment, the urban environment, but again thinking about kind of the future generation and their needs. That kind of morphed into smart growth. So if you all have master plans in your community, I bet you there is a list of these 10 tenants in your master plan somewhere. Um, but again, the same kind of concept, looking at sustainability, a more focused on land use and some of the fiscal impacts about land use decisions and where that infrastructure happens. And that's kind of morphed into this idea of resilience. Um, this is a de definition of the top that we've used in some of our materials. Um, I'm not going to read that one, but it's, it's similar to the things that you've seen. But the idea of resilience is you're really taking their principles and ideals of sustainable development and that smart growth, and you're really talking about how do we respond to that, how do we adapt to that. Um, and I think the idea is we want to do something better. There's, there's really no community that I've ever been to that says, no, we're good. If we respond to this shock, we're fine the way we were. You can always do better, right? So let's think about if we're going to respond to those shocks or those stresses, how do we do that in a better way? And then the, the bullet points that you see on the bottom are also kind of that value add to the idea of sustainability and smart growth. We really want to tailor the unique goals, objectives, and um, the things that we're thinking about to that specific community, there is no one size fits all. So it's very site specific. We wanna look at those hazards and those vulnerabilities that are specific to that community. We wanna use the best data or scientific knowledge available, but we don't wanna wait until that's exactly you know, perfect, essentially. We wanna use what we have, look at the existing trends, and kind of make predictions from there uh, and, move our, and move our planning processes forward. Um, a really heavy emphasis on natural systems, uh, kind of the green infrastructure as much as possible. And I don't know if you've heard this, this concept of adopt no regrets policies. So whether climate change is real, and I, I think every time I do a conversation like this, the answers to I don't think so or no is getting less and less and less, but there's still some communities that have that. Or even if those impacts aren't seen right away, those decisions that you're making are, are gonna be not regrettable. Those are things you wanna do just because they're sound planning processes. These were some of the things you were talking about this morning. There's a lot of frameworks for this. Obviously, NOAA um, has uh, their larger framework, which this conversation is a, is a part of. Uh, but there's several others. Uh, one that we like is from the Rockefeller Foundation, which really looks at the kind of systems approach. Uh, so Danella Meadows in 2008, if you haven't seen that book or read that book, Thinking in Systems, is really thinking about all the interconnected elements of your community, how they work off of each other and how they support each other. And you can see this is just a small listing of it, but 
Uh, your local leadership impacts decisions made on infrastructure, transportation, local foods has um, implications for um, your community. What kind of housing and infrastructure do we have? How does that affect public health, our cultural processes? They all work off of each other. Which for us makes sense since we're doing master planning, you typically address all these things in your master plan. Let's, let's talk about it within the systems approach. So that's the framework that we've been working on uh, quite a bit. Um, as some of you probably already know, and we talked a little bit about this before, uh, we're seeing a lot of efforts in terms of resilience at the federal level. Just about every department is doing something to some degree. Um, how that's being impacted by the Trump administration, let's just say it's in flux. Um, <laughs> but I was really encouraged on Tuesday, I was at the NOAA building in Ann Arbor. They hosted their first legislative roundtable to do all the staff of uh, Michigan's congressional districts senatorial uh, the two senators and then the governor's office just learning about what NOAA does and I can't tell you how great it was to see like government is still working they're still doing a lot of things all the way from the resilient work uh, all the things like Lisa mm -hmm. talked about earlier all the way to the National Weather Service they're still doing, still doing a lot of work um, and I don't see that changing drastically um, at the federal level at the state level we did have a Michigan climate action plan that was developed in 2009 it was very broad-based with direct input from just about everyone you see on the screen each of those departments in their own way is trying to incorporate climate change and resilience thinking in their plans uh, including one that we got to work with most recently which was the uh, michigan army national guard they have three large facilities in the state of michigan so fort custer fort grayling and then selfridge air force base we did climate adaptation plans for each of those bases because they see this as a huge threat to just their operations alone. So, but, you know, the Defense Department is thinking about this quite seriously. And then we see a lot of the planning associations, governmental associations, as I mentioned before, MML, MTA, MAP, they're all kind of, kind of moving towards this climate change resilience piece. Um, and now we've seen that really kind of trickle into a lot of the, the master plans, the local planning efforts that you've seen. Uh, this list is uh, over a year old, so I'm sure it's longer than that. So these communities either have chapter or chapters devoted to this topic or they kind of embed the conversation of resilience and climate change within their larger document um, so we see this now again happening more and more at the community level um, and they, these are just different ways that you can bring in resilience and climate change into your planning documents at the municipal level so they don't all have to be master plans they can be parks and recreation plans zoning ordinances which i'll talk about in a little bit obviously hazard mitigation plans really cross around jurisdictions and that's one thing that's really important as you're thinking about these larger concepts such especially from an environmental perspective and a cultural perspective that working across jurisdictions is really important but uh, even looking at uh, transportation and natural resources they all have a role in the community they're all part of that system and there's different ways to incorporate these uh, uh, ideas within uh, those efforts Last year, with funding from the Coastal Zone Management Program and a number of statewide experts from GLISA and MSU Extension and, and many, many others, uh, we developed a planning for community resilience in Michigan, a comprehensive handbook. How's that for a <coughs> exciting title? Um, but it really is just kind of a how-to about, uh, there we go. Um, um, about really what's going on in terms of resilience within the state of Michigan. Uh, so the first piece is really about what is resilience, what's going on in Michigan. Uh, we do talk about some of those climate impacts in the state. We talk about how to do civic engagement around this topic, uh, both at the uh, community level, but also at the planning commission level. Um, we talk about how to gather data, what data is important, where to get it, um, how to get it from kind of those fancy you know, charts that you see that we saw this morning into something that's digestible for a planning commission to make decisions. Um, we have a large uh, uh, toolbox, which is essentially the tools uh, to do resilience in your community and then some ideas for implementation. Um, that, that's all within that document. You can get that uh, off the uh, Resilient Michigan website, um, resilientmichigan.org. You can download that and maybe feed into some of your future planning efforts here uh, within this region. Uh, also on that website, uh, we did an eight-part video series on what does it mean to be resilient in Michigan, um, featuring many of those experts that helped us draft that document, uh, talking again about what is resiliency and what does that mean for your community and how to do that. So some resources that are available um, 
that might be helpful for some of your practice. Getting in the weeds a little bit, um, going back to the vulnerability idea. So we talked a lot about that this morning in terms of the natural resources. Um, what we tried to do is, okay, how do those natural uh, resources vulnerabilities impact the population of your community? Um, so this is kind of the, the vulnerability formula, your exposure, uh, which is the extent essentially of your environment, uh, plus sensitivity, which is looking at the individuals or the group or population that you're talking with to get your vulnerability. Um, so working in the Monroe community, we did a flooding vulnerability assessment uh, for the community. So first we looked at the exposure, so looking at where the 100 year flood and 500 year flood zones. And I think um, most of us are at a point where these zones, I'd say today, uh, again, in flux. They're probably not really accurate in terms of where that flooding is, but we had to start with some data, so this is what we started with. Um, then we looked at soils. Where do we actually see frequent ponding uh, in the city? Um, and then we started to look at, okay, what buildings are over squ uh, 500 square feet, thinking we're gonna get rid of the sheds and the garages. Let's look at, you know, kind of those building structures. Um, and then we took that data and we narrowed that down, looking at the class codes from um, uh, the city and the two townships to find out, okay, which one of those parcels are residential, which ones of those houses were probably built before 1940, because before 1940, building standards uh, weren't as tight as they are now in terms of mitigating against potential flooding. And then where might low housing value be, uh, low SCB, thinking that perhaps they don't have the funds to do some of the mitigation on their homes to protect them from flooding. Um, so we essentially came up with this uh, sensitivity of homes within the greater Monroe community. Uh, ways that then the city can then target maybe assistance programs to those homeowners to protect them against <coughs> flooding. Um, but again, thinking about how does that impact the people of your community. We also did the same thing with heat. And so that's one thing as you're talking about this larger process of what are we exposed to or what's our vulnerability in this region? I'm guessing it's probably not gonna be heat now, but if you saw those future trends, perhaps down the road we can be, uh, we can be talking about this. Because exposure to heat is actually one of the most deadly things that, can, that happens uh, on a yearly basis in Michigan in terms of people who actually die. Essentially, you're talking about a heat wave where you have above 90 degrees for two or three days when they actually open cooling centers, that type of thing. Uh, it happens more often than you think, especially on the downside of the state. Um, so we again took the idea of can we actually map where those sensitive populations are. Working with our partners at the University of Michigan, we identified essentially uh, five uh, sensitive populations. Uh, population 65 and older, people living alone, non-white population, people living in poverty, and people with less than a high school education. So we, did, we took each one of those five things and we used our JIS system to kind of rank the percentages uh, looking at census block and census tract within your community to map out, okay, where are the higher concentration of those populations. So this one is population 65 and older. Um, the higher concentration is red, the less concentration is in green. So we made maps like that for all five of those. So you get a combined heat sensitivity <coughs> index for the city of Monroe. So we took those five and we just layered them on top of each other, did the GIS, and then came up with this essentially new score. So anything in red are those populations within that community that are more sensitive to extreme heat events. So okay, we know about that. So what are the other things we need to consider? So what are the exposures? So we looked at impervious surface, right? Because we talked about the heat island effect, and if we have a lot of impervious surface, temperatures tend to be higher in those areas. We map that. And then we looked at tree canopy, understanding a less tree canopy means more heat kind of rising up in the atmosphere. So the more trees that we have keeps it cooler. Uh, we ranked that. And then we made a combined exposure heat map. So we took the, non, the uh, tree, tree canopy and then the impervious surface and combined that to a map. You with me here? Right. And then, so then the final map is the, phone, the final vulnerability heat. We took the people map essentially and then the exposure map, we laid them on top of each other, and this is what we got. So again, the areas in red that you see are those populations living, this is in Monroe, that are more prone to um, excessive heat events. So what do we do with that information? Well, we can overlay critical facilities on that map. Where is there maybe a gap in terms of where the cooling centers might be for that community? Where is the gap between the transportation network and those cooling centers? 
So the city and the two townships are now working at using this map to identify where we might provide services to the populations that are sensitive to heat when they have these events. So it goes in some of that emergency management planning, um, but now it's now seeped into their systems plan because we're talking about public services, we're talking about transportation. <clears throat> so the, the larger point of this of these maps is just to say, yes, looking at the vulnerability of your environmental systems is great and is important, but they also have a role in, ter a role in terms of how they impact people in your community. So thinking about that moving forward, I think is going to be uh, important. Okay, let me shift gears to a larger conversation. This is something that uh, over the last five years we've had with our partners at University of Michigan and uh, Michigan Tech. So typically, <coughs> um, we do these kind of presentations. I've done probably 15, 20 of these conversations. Um, and when we get to some of the information about lake levels and that data, it's usually uh, Dr. Guy Meadows from uh, Michigan Tech University who does that speech. Uh, so I'm gonna try to fill his role, uh, his shoes today. Um, so this is my slept at a Holiday Inn moment here, right? I'm not an expert, but I slept at a Holiday Inn last night. So I'm gonna do my best to translate his slides, but to get to this larger conversation. So we, we heard some of this this morning um, in terms of what we see in terms of trends for temperature and precipitation. Essentially everything is going up, right? We're gonna get warmer, we're gonna have more water. So what does that mean for the Great Lakes? <clears throat> okay, these are all the slides provided by Dr. Guy Meadows at the Great Lakes Research Center, Michigan Tech. Uh, so we have 2014, <coughs> looking at the Great Lakes, 92.5% of the Great Lakes frozen in 2014, which is just, if you think about how much surface water we have in the United States, 85% of it resides right here, and 92% of that was completely frozen in 2014. There's dramatic changes from uh, even just the year before. Uh, 2018 and February 12th was kind of the height for this past year. We were at 69%. Obviously, uh, that didn't last too long. I think this, this uh, uh, graph is up earlier, but this shows kind of the, the Great Lakes ice cover uh, from 1973 to 2017. <coughs> you can kind of see 1979, we're at 90, uh, 94%. Um, 1994, 89. Um, and then we're right down here, 2012 at 12%, and we're all time lows. And then within two years, we're at 92%. Dramatic shifts in terms of just 12% ice coverage to now we're at almost 92% ice coverage. So dramatic shifts in our atmosphere, which we still don't know how that's caused, but essentially that kind of ebb and flow between the polar air and some of that tropical air having significant changes within a short period of time. Um, and that has impacts um, beyond just the ice cover <coughs> because we're talking about also increased water levels. So this is actually uh, information from a buoy that's right off of the Keweenaw Peninsula in Lake Superior. Uh, this was the big storm in the fall of this past year. Uh, pretty dramatic winds coming off the north and it's kind of hard to see but <coughs> essentially this is only like a 12 to 14 hour gap in terms of these are wave heights that you see here. They were going to very you know, low wave heights to all the way to 15 feet. Now that is the mean of all that data. So as Guy explains it, there's waves probably twice as big as this. Every 5,000 wave goes twice as much as the mean. So we're talking about waves close to 30 feet within that time period. But that's only 12 hours. So that's contributing again, we talked about the impacts of climate change. What does that mean for <coughs> our communities, but also our water systems? <coughs> This was showed earlier as well, and I just want to point out, these are all the different lake levels for the Great Lakes. Uh, I'm looking at Lake Michigan and Huron. Essentially, you have, again, kind of 10 to 15 years here, um, towards the end of the graph, uh, where we have lake levels pretty significant, <laughs> uh, almost at our all-time low. And then with the matter of you know a couple years, we had uh, almost near highs. So these are um, graphs that show uh, lake levels for 2016, 2017, 2018, and their predictions. Uh, <coughs> make sure I got this right. Um, so the bars on the bottom show the all-time low uh, for those months. The bars at the top show the all-time high. Um, the red is what's happened, and then the red with the graph, this kind of image, uh, shows essentially what they're predicting of the next couple of months here in Lake Michigan. 
Um, essentially, Lake Michigan's about a foot below the all-time high, give or take. Um, but if you look here, this is Lake Superior. They're predicting they're about an inch below the all-time high right now. Uh, they're predicting that to essentially maintain its height, if not, you know, break the all-time high. Um, most of you know Lake Superior has 55% of the water volume of the Great Lakes, and all that flows down to Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, or Lake uh, Huron, and the rest of the Great Lakes. So the Great Lakes, in terms of water levels, will probably be high for the full uh, foreseeable future for some uh, for quite some time. And here's another graphic that shows that. So 2010. Just a rec almost a record low, and then just a couple of years later, 2016, um, you know, we're almost uh, at all-time high. Just a just a couple, just a foot about underneath the all-time high in Lake Michigan. Back in uh, the late 80s, when the water levels were at an all-time high, um, the state of Michigan said, "Well, we got to figure out what what does that mean for our beach profiles." Um, so they actually have points um, along Lake Michigan, and there's there's several in other lakes. <coughs> that really look at kind of the beach profile, looking at kind of where the beach comes up from under the water to the, essentially the top of the dune, to try to get kind of a historical perspective on how that's changed. Um, and this graph does show that, um, essentially looking again at where the beach comes up from the water to the top of the dune. Um, and it was response to this. So and in the eight, late <coughs> 80s, we had just about, we really had our highest water levels in the Great Lakes. Enough for it just scored the, the shoreline. So this is essentially a depressed beach. I mean, you really bounce a basketball on it almost. And what, what are they wiping away? They're wiping away all the sediment and everything that the glacier packed down for generations and generations. So all that got washed out. And so you see communities trying to, you know, try to mitigate that by throwing everything they can, rip rap, gravel, just to stop some of that erosion. So dramatic erosion along the Great Lakes. This is in Ludington. Uh, this is also in Ludington. So here's the difference between, again, high lake levels and then low lake levels. So <clears throat> these two houses, the house on the big picture and the house here on the bottom are the same house. They've had a little structural work done to it. Um, but you can kind of see the, the boulders here, and you can kind of see the little odd prop of boulders underneath that little shed there. That's the same beach. So when lot, the lake levels are high, right, they essentially scrape off the beach. When lake levels are low, what do they do? It kind of spits up the sand back up on the, on the beach. So what we have now is all that nice sugar sand that we're so used to and it's part of our kind of pure Michigan identity, right? <clears throat> that gets built up with the grasses and eventually that sugar sand beach gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as water levels go down. There's another example of this. Uh, this is near New Buffalo, right on kind of the Michigan-Indiana border, 1988. You can see the, the, the uh, pipe coming out. Um, you, it's hard to see, but that same pipe is right here in that top picture. That's in 2008. So dramatic shifts in terms of how big that beach is also means dramatic shifts in terms of how much private property we have versus public private property that we have. And I think that's kind of the biggest question <coughs> that we're going to be talking about. So we have an ordinary high water mark at about 580 feet above sea level. Graph is kind of hard to read, but essentially the orange and reds are the, the beach profile or the elevation back in 88. And you can see down in 2008. That's a difference of about 200 and 250 feet in terms of how much that beach has grown and gone down. Think about it again. If water levels are coming back up, we had all those local, uh, lake levels low. We have issues like this. So the blue line is the ordinary high water mark in 1998. This is now near uh, New Buffalo. The red line <coughs> is the actual shore. And then essentially what's happened is the, the beach has gotten larger, which means your ordinary high water mark has gone lakeward. So now there's 200 more feet of beach. So what happens in terms of development? Essentially, the EQ owns everything lakeward of the ordinary high water mark. Property owners own everything landward of the ordinary high water mark. So some years, the homeowner has 200 extra feet of their property. Some years, the state takes it back, back and forth, back and forth as lake level goes up and down. But what happens when lake levels go down for as long as they did, a period of 10 years, you start to see development like this happen. 
So that's the biggest question that I think needs to be discussed <clears throat> all over the Great Lakes, is are we allowing that development to get too close to the water without realizing what those events in terms of lake levels mean when they come back up? And what we found is most communities have very short memories. <laughs> they don't remember. Until you have a conversation like this, and they're like, oh, I remember in 1988, we had to get the high school football team to come bring down sandbags. So, very short memory. So, <clears throat> this has been our poster child house, poor house. Uh, but this is just north of St. Joe. Um, you see how close it is to the water. This is 2012, I think this photo was taken. So, what we've done with our partners at U of M and Michigan Tech is start to look at some of the aerial photography to see how much that's changed, what that means for not only the development that's on the shore now, but potentially what's going to come down the road <coughs> in years to come. Um, so, we were able to get aerial photography going back to 1938. Um, that's the beach essentially at that location. Uh, 1960, let's go on Lakeward. Now they got their original house. This is 19, 1985, still pretty close to the water if you look at that. Um, now the beach has gone down again in 1996, so much more beach. 2002, even more beach. <laughs> and now this is their new home. That's actually the, the home, the, owner, oh, the, the owner's own, the big home and the home behind it. <clears throat> but now you start to see that water come back up and they built that much closer because again, that ordinary high water mark has shifted. So essentially by right, they can build a house there. So if we go back and look at those old scenarios, guess what? That house is gonna be underwater in 1938, 1960. I mean, you do the math, right? You just go down and this is all of them together. Essentially most years that house was gonna be underwater when those lake levels came back up. So what we're seeing is that this kind of thing is happening all over the state. Not in large chunks where there's like a, you know, a thousand homes, but enough homes where it's an issue and so what happens is we start to get, oh, well, here's the house being moved now for the second time. They're literally picking it up and moving it back, much to the chagrin of all the neighbors who live right next to them. Think about the cost of this. So this is happening enough where the company, you kind of see the logo on the bottom, is advertising, we'll move your house for you, or obviously a certain, free, but there's actually a business now that will do this. All right. So what are we getting? The homeowner says, I just spent $2 million on this home. I'm not gonna lose it. I don't care what natural processes say. I'm gonna build a seawall. <laughs> that will fix everything, right? <laughs> if uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers flew obliques of the entire Lake Michigan shoreline, you can actually just go right down the shoreline, click, 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 and see all these shots, your jaw would drop at how many seawalls and how massive they are being built along Lake Michigan. So here's one. <clears throat> There's not even a house on the water, it's set way back. It's essentially a cul-de-sac, they're going to build more homes on it, but that's kind of a tiered seawall with a pool in the middle of it. This is down again near St. Joe. Here's another one. More and more of these are going up, and they have a serious impact on the shoreline because it changes the flow of sand, for one, and what it does is that that impacts your neighbor and you get things like this, right? <coughs> so we actually have Supreme, Michigan Supreme Court, the Glass decision in 2005 says that every citizen has a right to walk on the beach. And that's part of what our identity as a state is, right? So part of our Pure Michigan. If we have private property owners developing these seawalls, are they taking away the public's right to the beach? So this was the conversation I wanted to like, just get started maybe here today is, we don't, I don't have the answer, but we have a pretty strong tradition of private property rights in the state, but we also have a pretty strong tradition of the public right, especially when it comes to our identity and walking on the beach. You can kind of see this. This is <coughs> just, again, north, north of New Buffalo. Um, sea wall here, right? So what is it doing to the neighbor to the south? Right? It just eats away the sand. On the north side, you actually get larger, you get more sand. <coughs> and the same thing over here. They're putting a little riprap here and you start to see erosion. So essentially, if you put a seawall up, great for you, but what have you done to your neighbors? And potentially, what do you do to the overall health of the beach? Right, this is the image we're all marketing, right? So that's the conversation that I think needs to happen. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose that back out to you here in a minute, but some of the <clears throat> policy work that we've done to help mitigate this, we did a, essentially an overlay ordinance with uh, the city of Grand Haven 
on their North Shore district and their South Shore district. <coughs> and we modeled it after a similar ordinance that was done in the city of St. Joe because of that house. But we essentially said, this is a, uh, a plat map of all the waterfront property on the North Shore of Grand Haven. Um, so we started to look at <coughs> some of the uh, data associated with, again, the ebb and flow of the water within that area. Talking with the state of Michigan, they have kind of a 50 year flood elevation at about 583 feet, which is again, a little bit a landward of the ordinary high water mark. That was established in 1992. They look at that periodically, but that's right now the 50 year flood zone or elevation. So we actually started with that number and said, well, let's look at the rest of the beach. We know that they actually have a high risk erosion area where they're projecting essentially recession rates for 60 years at about 115 feet in some areas, 145 feet in some other areas. So we said, well, we know that's gonna probably happen. So we said, okay, there's that line. And so that's essentially the, the 60 year projected recession distance. So we said, well, should we think about having essentially a line in the sand? Um, we're saying we're not gonna allow anything to be built past that line and we're not gonna allow any uh, seawall structures. So that's essentially what we did. We established an overlay zone saying no, no seawalls will be developed lakeward of this line and no homes will be moved lakeward of this line. So even though all the ordinary high water mark is set by the DEQ, local planning and zoning can actually create these districts. So there's our line, essentially. We need to go back and look at the historical uh, photos of this. <coughs> and we're actually probably pretty conservative. So there's 70, here's 74. Here's 86, large, pretty high. 1998, 2014, a lot more beach. And we put those lines on the map to kind of show where they all are. The black line is our proposed setback. So we're, we're not even aggressive here. But politically, to put our line anywhere closer, especially as that kind of, as, as the shoreline goes north, it gets really close to the current existing homes. So there was issues about not conforming, it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So even though that we use kind of the technical skills to put these things together, there is a political side of this conversation that has to happen. <coughs> that might be the last. Yeah, that's the last slide. So I guess, so last week we did this with uh, about 125 planners. We just kind of threw it out there to see what people think <coughs> about, you know, what is the right of the private property owner versus what is the rights of the public good? Is someone in Lansing who doesn't live on the shoreline but identifies the coastline as part of their state, part of their identity, should they have say? Should, there should be their estate say about how this works, or should it all be localized? Or what is the kind of the give and take between private property owners and that public good? No one solved that problem, so there's no wrong answers here. So I'm hoping that we could spend just a couple of minutes just hearing from folks on their opinions on it. <coughs> 